everything is copy, whether it's words on your website, the writing used in your ad, captions on your social media posts, the messages that you send to customers and clients. The copywriting is persuading people through language. And really that is fundamentally what marketing is all about. So in this video, I'm gonna share six copywriting tricks that every marketer should know. Good copy sells more and it always has done. Right at the start of my marketing career, I really got fascinated with some of the greats of the advertising and marketing history, if you like. People like David Ogilvy, uh, John Caples, Claude Hopkins. These are people that operated at a time where marketing technology was minimal. They didn't have Facebook ad audiences. They didn't have retargeting pixels. All they had were magazine or newspaper ads and long form sales letters sent through direct mail. Copy was the star of the show. Now these days, there's so much attention in marketing on the technology, on the media buying side of the marketing world. So this is the Facebook ads, how we get the message out to clients and customers. But really what's often forgotten is the copy, the actual message that we are communicating with these people. And what's most fascinating about copywriting is that the fundamentals of good copy haven't changed. In this video, we're gonna look at some examples from the old grades, and we're also gonna look at some very modern examples. And we will see that whilst the language might change, the particular words that are being used, the principles that are at play haven't changed at all and will never change because fundamentally this is about persuading people to do something, to take an action. Oh, I hope you're ready to geek out. I love this stuff. Copywriting trick number one is the use of meaningful specifics. Meaningful specifics, Tim, what does that mean? Let me show you a very good example. So Apple are absolute masters at the use of meaningful specifics. This is their sales page for the iPhone 13 Pro, which is essentially the iPhone 12 Pro, but it's got a slightly better camera, it's a little bit stronger, and it's a bit faster. That's essentially the, the, the gist of what they're selling, but they use meaningful specifics to make it feel like an absolutely revolutionary product. So here's the intro copy. A dramatically more powerful camera system, a display so responsive every interaction feels new again the world's fastest smartphone chip, exceptional durability, and a huge leap in battery life. Let's pro. Now the use of the word pro is important, we'll come back to that later on, but I wanna draw your attention to some of the very specific things that they're talking about here. So this phone is essentially the same as the last one, but what they do is they pitch very specific features and go into detail about them to make it feel completely revolutionary. For example, here we have the side body, this isn't just stainless steel, this is surgical grade stainless steel. The glass, huh? but it's not glass, it's a ceramic shield, tougher than any smartphone glass, which by the way, covers the liquid retina display, which is basically a high resolution display with rounded edges, but it's not, it's a liquid retina display. Then we've got industry leading IP68 water resistance, why not call it splash proof or waterproof, right? Because this gives us meaningful specifics. Further on down we go, we've got this new camera. Um, what's great about the camera? Well, there's specific details. 2.2X more light through the wide camera. 92% more light through the ultra wide camera. So why do they go into detail when they could just say, better camera, won't smash so much when you drop it while you're on the toilet? because these meaningful specifics give credibility. This is not about sharing the dull minutia that nobody cares about. It's about identifying specific things and giving enough detail to paint a picture in the audience's mind of this being very detail focused and very, very believable. Now I'm gonna show you another example, this time from Ogilvy on advertising. This is an ad uh, written by David Ogilvy's agency back in the 50s, I think, for a Rolls Royce. Now, this ad is fantastic. We'll show you a picture of the ad on the screen. Uh, firstly, we've got the image of the Rolls Royce at the top. This car looks massive. The headline, genius. At 60 miles an hour, the loudest noise in this new Rolls Royce comes from the electric clock. Now, the ad itself is made up of 13 bullet points illustrating why this is the best car in the world, okay? And all of these are essentially little mini stories about specific features of the product. So for example, bullet point number five says, the finished car spends a week in the final test shop being fine-tuned. 
Here it is subjected to 98 separate ordeals. For example, the engineers use a stethoscope to listen for axle whine. Now you could say that's an irrelevant detail that no purchaser of a Rolls Royce ever needs to know. But I would challenge you, they might not need to know it, but telling them that gives them a feeling of the QA and the attention to detail that goes into building this car. It's all about painting a picture and telling a story through these meaningful specifics. So here's your question. If you are better than your competitors, how specifically are you better? What are the specific details of your product or service that you can share with customers to give them an insight into how much you are better than everybody else? For example, this is a lightweight plastic tripod. Um, but if I said, would you like this lightweight plastic tripod? You might think, hmm, that sounds like a fairly cheap commoditized product. But what if instead this was an ultra portable tripod engineered from aluminium and techno polymer capable of withstanding the most extreme conditions on earth? Well, technically that's true. That's exactly what this is, but it sounds completely different. A lightweight plastic tripod sounds like crap. Whereas an ultra portable tripod engineered from aluminium and techno polymer capable of standing the most extreme conditions on earth sounds like something that you would pay a premium for. It's the same tripod with the same features, but the use of meaningful specifics elevate it completely. Copywriting trick number two is to answer objections. Now, most people are comfortable with the idea of answering objections, but treat this as a sales thing. Answering objections is something the sales team do. Well, I would challenge you, if you're not answering objections in your copy, people aren't even having a conversation with your sales team. We need to make sure that their core objections are answered before we even ask them to convert. Back to the Ogilvy ad. Now, this car looks absolutely massive. One of the objections that they will have faced is this thing looks like a ship. There is no way I could drive that. So what they have done very cunningly Two of the bullet points right at the start of the ad tackle this objection head on. Bullet point number three says, the Rolls Royce is designed as an owner driven car. It is 18 inches shorter than the largest domestic cars. They are taking that objection on head on. Yeah, this thing looks massive, but actually it's smaller than some and it's been designed for you to drive. Bullet point number four, the car has power steering, power brakes and automatic gear shift. It is very easy to drive and to park. No chauffeur required. Now the no chauffeur required bit is really smart because there's an implication of luxury there that otherwise this is a chauffeur car. But the fact that they are taking those objections head on is really clever. So think through, what are the objections that a potential customer might have to doing business with you or even just taking the next step in your sales process? And are you answering those in your sales copy? Trick number three is to get your customers to say the things that you can't. Okay, I'm gonna show you an example of this. So this is the Boom by Cindy Joseph range. This is a, a business owned and run by Ezra Firestone, a fantastic marketer. And look at the product page on this site. The first headline that you see isn't the product name. I think that's the product name. This is the first thing that you see. Not exaggerating when I say these are the absolute best products I have ever used from Joeen A, Boomstick Trio customer. Okay, Boom desperately want to say this is the best makeup product that you've ever used, but they can't really say that because if they say that, they come across a bit, you know, right? But they can use their customers to say it. Now, we've been using testimonials in Ad Creative for a long time. For example, in Facebook ads, if we've got a product which is maybe kind of difficult to explain or we just really want to sell the benefit but we can't just make a huge claim ourselves, we'll use a testimonial that makes that claim or says the lovely thing about the product that we can't. This is also to an extent what a brand does when it shares an influencer's review of its product because the influencer is talking in a very compelling way, saying the things that a brand doesn't want to. So rather than the brand saying that thing, it can just share the influencer's post which is why influencer marketing can be so effective. Now, I've always been fascinated by weight loss marketing. It's a really interesting space, not least because we are basically selling to people that very often don't want to make any changes in their life at all, but they want uh, a different result. So a lot of marketing has to tread this very thin line between saying you don't have to change anything, which is of course not true, 
but they also want to sell the result that people are going to get. And Weight Watchers, or WW as it's now known, treads this line all day, every day. They are constantly telling their potential customers, you don't need to change anything about your life and yet you're gonna lose weight in various ways. Here's a current ad that they're running, which does exactly that. So again, they've gotta be careful about what they can say, but they can get a customer to say, you can eat bread every day and lose weight. The underlying message there is, you can still do what you wanna do, but you're gonna get this result. So again, they're using the customer to say something that they can't or that they don't want to do. If you're enjoying this absolute geek out into copy, then you might also want some help with your digital marketing. The team here at Exposure Ninja, this is exactly what we do. We help our clients get more sales through their websites, through their ad campaigns, and we help get them more traffic through things like social media and search. If you want us to analyze your current website, your digital marketing, and map you out a prioritized action plan that you can follow to get more leads and sales, then we have an amazing service called the free website and marketing review. In this, one of our team will take a look at your current digital marketing. They'll have a look at your analytics if you want them to, and they will map you out a prioritized action plan to follow to generate more leads and sales through your website over the next six to 12 months. It's an incredible service and it's totally free of charge. There is no obligation to use Exposure Ninja at all. If you want this, then go to ExposureNinja.com forward slash review and request your free website and marketing review today. On with the geek out. Now tip number four comes from Dan Kennedy from his excellent, excellent book, The Ultimate Sales Letter. This is my very dog-eared copy. And that is to read your copy out loud. When you've written your own copy, particularly when you're reading it on a screen, the tendency is to miss out the glitches and the little bits that feel a bit weird because you know what it says. Whereas reading it out loud makes you process it in the same way that the reader is going to be processing it. So it's really good to read your copy out loud. Now, Dan in the sales letter book talks about one of his clients who would not only read the copy out, they were selling to blue collar workers. So they would go down to a bar and they would read the copy out to the people at the bar who were basically their target audience. Now, of course, they were looking for things like, do these audience people have any questions? Are there any unanswered questions or objections that we need to cover in the copy? But they were also looking for the golden response, which was, where can I get this? This sounds amazing. And that would tell them that they were onto a real winning proposition and they had some great copy. Reading your copy out loud also helps because it's much easier to read simple copy than complicated copy. And generally, we want to write for a younger and less experienced audience than our actual customers because it's very tempting to write complex, wordy copy if we have an educated customer. Whereas actually, when people are reading something for the first time, that stuff can be quite impenetrable. It can be quite difficult to consume. So generally, we want to tone things down, use simpler sentences, and write for a much more basic audience than actually our customers might be. Tip number five is to use scarcity. Now, Robert Ringer has a fantastic book called Winning Through Intimidation. And I know that the word intimidation doesn't exactly sound very, you know, PC. But what he's really talking about is intimidation tactics in copy. Now, one of the intimidation tactics is the use of scarcity. Scarcity is a well-known principle in sales. So for example, if you have a limited supply of something, then you will let your customers know that you have a limited supply because if there's one thing people don't like, it's being told that they can't have something. So that will increase their perceived value of it and their desire to get it. So that's one element of scarcity. But another intimidation tactic is to say that most people will buy something, to imply that this is a very popular choice, most people are going to get it. The implication there, of course, is that if you don't get it, you are an outsider, there's something wrong with you, there's something weird. So you can use this tactic in your copy to just imply that something is a very popular and safe choice. I remember listening to a story from a guy called Simon Coulson who was out buying his new Ferrari, and the Ferrari salesman was saying, well, do you want to buy these little flashing lights at the top of the steering wheel showing you when you need to change gear? And he said, oh, that doesn't really sound like an extra that I'm massively going to use, so I'm okay. And the Ferrari salesman did a genius thing. He said, so many people get this extra feature that if you don't, you might impact the resale value of the car. Kind of got you, hasn't he? What do you do? 
He bought the stupid lights, of course, because most people do. Now there's actually an inverse force to this that you can use in your copy, and that is that not everyone is qualified to buy this. Back to our friends with the iPhone. Why is this iPhone called the iPhone 13 Pro? Why do they talk about Pro and why do they use Pro so much in their copy? Well, they do this because a small percentage of the population identify themselves as Pro. This plays to their self-image, they see themselves as somewhat superior in some way and this means that they are more attracted to this because it is not for everyone. This isn't for the mere mortals, this is for the pros. I speak with fairly detailed knowledge of this audience. Now I'm going to read you another old ad, this time from John Capel's book Making Ads Pay and this uses exactly this same principle. So I'm going to just read you a snippet of it, not the whole thing. Now the headline says, a wonderful two years trip at full pay, but only men with imagination can take it. Now as I'm reading this, I want you to think about how are they disqualifying people? How are they saying that not everyone is qualified for this? The ad says, about one man in 10 will be appealed to by this page. The other nine will be hard workers, earnest, ambitious in their way, but to them, a coupon is a coupon, a book is a book, a course is a course. The one man in 10 has imagination and imagination rules the world. This is amazing. The leap of logic is only one person in 10 is going to be interested in this and is going to buy this. That is because they have imagination. That is because imagination rules the world. So they've made a link there between one in 10 will buy this. Those that do rule the world. It's superb. And of course, what does it do? It dismisses and ridicules everybody who doesn't get this as they are ambitious in their way. I mean, what a cuss on those people. A book is a book, you know, these are basic, dumb, stupid people, but you know, this is not for the superior, the people who really rule the world with imagination. Isn't it amazing? So look at how you can play to your customer's ego. How can you differentiate your customer from the people that don't buy and make sure that they feel special because they are buying from you. Copywriting trick number six, and this is really a super tip, is to make it entertaining. And the reason this is a super tip is because if your copy isn't entertaining, people won't even see the other techniques that they're using because they won't read it. As Victor Schwab says, more adults go to movies than to schools of instruction. The equivalent today would be that more people are flicking through TikTok in their evenings than they are reading detailed guides and going on Wikipedia to truly educate themselves. We are all here to be entertained. One of my favorite modern copywriters is Frank Kern and he advises people who are gonna be studying copy to read trashy novels and tabloid newspapers because these are fantastic at getting and holding people's attention, often even if they're in very distracting environments. Now the first step to making your copy entertaining is to think about your headline. Now we're gonna show you a page of Google search results and I want you to think about what's the first thing that you notice on this page. Probably the headlines. What do you notice first about this page? Probably the headline, right? Now, according to Copyblogger, eight out of 10 people read a headline and only two out of 10 people will read the body copy. Now, I was actually in two minds about adding that stat because I don't know where they got it from or what it actually relates to. But if you watch any eye tracking surveys, then you'll see a very similar thing where people do go straight to the headline. And if you do the flash test, then it's consistently the information in the headline that is most easy to recall. Now, often with digital marketing, there are competing forces for our headlines. For example, on a page like this, where they would want to rank this page on Google for camera backpacks. So they can't just look at this as a pure copywriting exercise. It also has to be an SEO exercise. But actually using your target keywords as your headline can make it very compelling because don't forget, if I just typed in camera backpacks and I found this page and I see the keyword camera backpacks, that is exactly what I'm looking for. That is exactly the phrase that I've got going in my head. So I'm gonna get this sense of, ah, I'm in the right place, which is basically what a good headline can do. But let's talk about entertaining copy and what makes entertaining copy. Well, this ties back to writing conversationally, writing how you would talk. When's the last time you were having a conversation with someone and you just tuned out 
walked off and went somewhere else. Well, if you're my wife, it happens a lot. That, that, that's another story. But most of the time, our conversations keep us engaged because we're used to having a conversation with someone where they're talking in an engaging and interesting way. So why, when we're writing for our marketing, do we lose that ability to communicate in an engaging way and instead revert to overly boring, bland, dry copy style? It doesn't make any sense at all. And yet almost everybody does it. This is why more people engage on social with influencer posts than business posts because the influencers are interesting and conversational and the businesses are boring. It's also why you see brands using more emojis because they want to replicate that conversational informal style that their audience adopts. Now, whilst it's fairly common to see emojis in Facebook ad copy and in email subject lines, I suspect we will see an increasing usage of emojis in website copy as well, as people try to make it more engaging and replicate the sort of interactions that we're used to having with people on our devices. Another way to make your copy engaging is to make sure that you're signposting people to the sections that are most relevant for them. Again, Apple does a pretty good job of this by not only breaking up their sales page with images and different transitions and different types of um, engagement and animation, but also, by signposting each section so people can find the information that is most relevant to them. There is nothing worse for copy engagement than forcing people to trawl through huge body chunks of copy in order to find the stuff that's of interest to them. I say there's nothing worse, there's plenty of things that are worse, but, but for keeping someone's attention with copy, it's not ideal. So use short sentences, active language. Above all, talk about the things that are most interesting to your customer particularly if you can talk about your customer themselves. Talking about people's current situations, their problems, their hopes and dreams is really engaging. There is nothing that we want to read more than writing which is about us, which makes us feel like we're being listened to and that we're being heard. So write about your customer and you will keep them engaged. Just checking, have you subscribed to the channel yet? We release at least one, mostly two videos a week, and we have a live teardown session on Friday. If you're into digital marketing or you just love marketing or you're growing a business, it's definitely worth subscribing. Back to the geekery. So there you have it. Six copywriting tricks that every marketer should know to help you sell more. We looked at using meaningful specifics, answering objections, letting your customers say the things that you can't, using those testimonials to make those big, bold claims. Reading your copy out loud, you can take this to another level by reading it to someone else or even reading it to your target customer and you're looking for that, oh, that sounds good, where can I get this type response? We also looked at using scarcity and the three flavors of that. Remember, limited supply, most people will buy this and also the flip version of that, which is most people won't qualify for this. And then finally, we talked about keeping your copy engaging and the various tools and techniques that you can use to do that. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, drop us a like. Also drop us a comment. Let us know how you're enjoying these videos and any other topics that you would like us to cover in future videos. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon as well. We usually release two videos a week, plus having a live website teardown session on a Friday where we get people's websites up and rip them apart in the friendliest possible way and help them put them back together again. Until next time, see you soon.